Well, if the news is to be believed, uh, the assassination attempt on President Trump two weeks ago was entirely preventable. Now, this isn't a political sermon. I'm not going to be talking about presidents, past or future, um, but it's fascinating to watch the chain of events play out in real time. And it, it doesn't matter which side of the political aisle you fall on or um, how many conspiracy theories you ascribe to or, or hate. The facts are clear. Um, two people are dead and many are injured. And it was entirely preventable. Advanced warnings were disregarded. Basic precautions were not taken. And last minute alarms were not ignored. Uh, last minute alarms were ignored. And the results were deadly. Again, I'm not talking about politics this morning. Our topic that we have before us is much more serious and much more deadly. We're going to read in a moment about treachery, about bloodshed, even mass graves, the likes of which the most evil despots in history pale in comparison to. It's not something about foreign soils. It's not military in nature. It's something that every single person in this room needs to be prepared for and on guard against because it is something that is entirely preventable. This morning, I'm pleading with you. Your life is at stake. So don't disregard it and don't ignore it. We're in Proverbs chapter 7. And unlike most of the sermons in this Proverbs series, we're spending the summer in the book of Proverbs, uh, unlike most of the other weeks, today we're going to be looking at the whole chapter. And what we'll find is a father laying out warnings and laying out precautions for his son to be on alert. He's pleading with him to do three things. To count the cost, to spot the traps, and to guard his heart. Let's read it together. I want to read the whole chapter and then come back and look at individual parts. So we're in Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, pretty much right there in the middle of your Bible. And it says this, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house, I've looked out through my lattice and I've seen among the simple, I've perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him. And with a bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vows. So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I've found you. I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he'll come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. And her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me, and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers 
of death. What is this deadly foe that has brought so much damage and destruction? Well, specifically, Solomon talks about adultery. Watch out for the forbidden woman, the, the adulteress. And the narrative here describes a specific instance involving a woman and a foolish man. And there are very clear, easy instructions to take from this. Sons, right? men, watch out for this woman. Women, don't be like this woman. Right? There are clear instructions that we should be on the lookout for. But we would be gravely mistaken if we limited this chapter to only talking about adultery between a married woman and a foolish man. The implications here that are made clear throughout the rest of the uh, Scriptures is this. Sexual immorality. Any type of sexual immorality will cost you your soul. It is so deadly, I want Solomon to warn you here to count the cost and to spot the traps and to guard your heart. And to do that and to see that, we're actually going to work our way backwards through the text. And so let me plead with you first to count the cost. I wasn't being overly dramatic at the beginning when I described this deadly scenario. The, the language in this chapter is graphic. It's meant to be. And it's graphic in a way that we typically don't think of when it comes to adultery or to immorality. Verse 22, this foolish young man follows this woman as an ox goes to the slaughter. Or a deer that's, that's caught and then shot with an arrow. These are bloody images. I've never been hunting before. I'm not opposed to it. I've just never been. Um... But before moving back to Texas, we lived in Hillbilly, New Hampshire, um, the mountains and the woods. I mean, like our town, our, our whole county had one stop sign and one sidewalk. The rest was all extremely rural. At the time we lived there, I was a runner, and I loved like jogging the, the trails through the, the hills and the mountains. Um, but we had to be careful during hunting season. There were, there were warnings everywhere posted on the trees uh, like during hunting season. Like, wear bright clothing, be alert, <laughs> duck if there's any shots. I didn't, that, not that last part, but it was implied, right? Um, but for me, the hardest part about that was um, the route would take me by the corner store, which was just 300 feet from our house, and that was usually the way that I ended my run. And the reason it was hard was because during hunting season, the parking lot of the corner store was where people would bring the deer that they had shot to be cleaned or, or what have you. And it wasn't a big space. I and mean, there were only six parking spots in this corner store. And right in the middle was a place to hang the deer. And so throughout the entire hunting season, you'd come and there would just be a flow of blood covering the parking lot. It was messy. It was ugly. It was deadly. Solomon's point of an ox being led to slaughter, or a stag caught until it's shot, or a bird trapped in the snare, is to show the animal doesn't know that it's in danger, and it comes to a bloody, gruesome end. The imagery here is that foolishness when it comes to immorality meets a gruesome death. And the hunter in Proverbs 7 is this adulteress. We'll talk more about her in the next point, but I want to draw attention to what's left in her wake. Verse 26, Many a victim has she laid low. All her slain are a mighty throng. Now again, we know this isn't talking about a real specific woman. It's a metaphor. It's not like this woman was a serial killer and, and hiding the bodies of all of her partners you know, in the town dump. It's one of the ways we know this is talking about all immorality, all adultery, uh, in general, any, toward, any sort of sexual immorality. But the imagery is clear that following this woman and falling into her traps is deadly. The number of those whose lives on earth 
and whose souls in eternity have been destroyed by sexual immorality far outweighs those who have actually been killed in genocide and war. Living in sexual immorality puts you, verse 27, on the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. That's what Sheol is. It's like the abode of the dead. And to make sure I'm clear on this, the Bible's definition of sexual immorality is any type of sex or sexual act or sexual thought outside of one man, one woman marriage. It it includes adultery, yes, but also homosexuality, prostitution, singles hooking up for a night, shacking up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, lust, pornography, all of that is included. Solomon, by the way, knew firsthand the destruction of this immorality. Remember, it was his own mother and father committing adultery before he was born that caused so much damage in King David's house. In his own life, Solomon gave himself to immorality. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Scripture says that when he was old, they turned his heart aside from following the Lord. You cannot live in sexual immorality and follow the Lord. You cannot live in sexual immorality and follow the Lord. One must go. And if you choose to stay in immorality and abandon the Lord, it will be your destruction. Proverbs 6 also talks about this. And it says in 6.27, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? The answer to that is no. This fool in verse 23 embraces the temptation and does not realize it will cost him his life. And so it doesn't matter how acceptable any particular sin is in our day. 1 Corinthians 6 is very clear. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who promise homosexuality, but it branches beyond that as well, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. How much does immorality cost? It costs you everything. And if that's the case, then we need to be able to spot the traps. The second second point for us this morning, spot the traps. We come back to this portrait of the adulteress, and, and she's out on the prowl. Verse 10, Behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. When the Apostle Peter gives his warning of your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, same picture here. This is not an innocent woman walking to the store. This isn't a woman that's caught up in the emotions or the temptations of a moment. She's on the hunt. And as one pastor put it, she's dressed to kill, like a prostitute. And wise men will see this from a distance and say, that is a spiritual assassin. This is someone who wants to bring about my death and will avoid it at all costs. They won't see it as an opportunity. They'll see it as a danger and run away. Now, in our day, when we read dressed like a prostitute, maybe an image pops in your mind of something you've seen on TV, someone scantily clad, walking a street corner, something like that, um, clad. Um, But that's not what the prostitutes in Solomon's day did. They were still fully covered, but they would make their outfit very extravagant, very loud. Um, they would cover, usually cover their lower half of their face with a veil, and so they'd have tons of makeup on their eyes to draw attention to them. And they would wear this veil, why? To hide their true identity. They would want to draw attention to themselves and say, hey, I'm available, but yet they did not want anyone to know who they truly were. You can uh, look and see um, in the life of... uh, Judah in Genesis, he does the same thing. He's caught up by this uh, prostitute who's not really a prostitute, it's his own daughter, daughter-in-law faking it. The woman we read about had a husband, 
probably a wealthy one. And she's walking in her neighborhood. People would know who she is. So she hid it. Which is at the heart of all adultery. Hiding. It's done in secret. Most sexual sin is. People hide because they know it's wrong, and so they have things like fake names and rendezvous points, any, anything to keep you from remembering the truth of what's really going on. In particular, when you think of something like pornography, one of the reasons it's so dangerous in our day is that you don't have to go to some decrepit building in a seedy part of town to get it. There's a veil of a screen that we have in front of us at all times, but it keeps you from seeing the person's true identity. They don't want you to know. The makers of pornography don't want you to know that this is someone who is created in God's image. This is someone's daughter. This is someone's sister. Maybe even someone's mother or wife. There's this veil of distance and this veil of pixels that keep you from recognizing the true identity. And this woman in Proverbs 7, it's not just her identity she's hiding, it says that she's wily at heart. Now, you hear that and you think, well, that, that seems like she's wild, right? But that word wily means cunning, it means crafty, it's, it means guarded. She's guarding her true self, she's guarding her true intentions. The enemy is crafty, as we've already seen. Her goal is destruction. She wants this young fool dead. And so let's not fall into the trap of thinking, as as many in our day would, that the problem in Proverbs 7 is that this particular woman just happens to be sinister. In our day, we are too quick to excuse sin away. They say things like, well, not all adultery is bad. Some people are just following their hearts. You don't know what their lives are like at home, and they're, just, they're needing just some emotional fulfillment that they're not getting from their spouse. You know, it's not all bad. They're just following their hearts. So they argue, well, the Bible isn't talking about those adulterers, just the sinister ones. And arguments like that miss the point. The enemy here is the enemy. Satan and his minions want you destroyed. That's the point. But the enemy is not going to come at you with like an upside down cross and pentagrams. He's going to come at you cunningly, appealing to your urges. He's not going to come at you with guns drawn. He's going to come dressed as a prostitute. And so you have this this temptress with feet that won't stay in one place in verse 12. Now in the street, now in the market, at every corner she lies in wait. I mean, danger is everywhere, ready to pounce. And she pounces on our young fool. Verse 13, she seizes him and kisses him. Now in our day, that doesn't really mean anything. But in that day, there weren't public displays of affection. You even see in a graphic book like Song of Solomon, they don't grab up and meet in public like this. It was brazen. She doesn't even speak to him first. She just runs up to him and kisses him. He should have been shocked by this lack of decorum. He should have been, whoa, 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 wait, what's going on here? This is not what honorable, wise, respectable, pure, holy people do. He should have been upset that someone grabbed him and kissed him, but instead he is aroused by the sudden physical affection. That's not all. She kisses him, and then it says, with a bold face, she says to him, look at verse 14. I had to offer sacrifices today, and today I've paid my vows. So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly. I have found you. I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. She starts with, I did my sacrifices. I paid my vows. And there are two ways that we could interpret this. It could be, okay, well, look, I'm a good person. Just because I'm being forward with you and just because I want to do something wrong, it doesn't make me a bad person. right? I did my sacrifices. This is a common ploy of the enemy, religious hypocrisy. Just because I'm doing something bad doesn't make me bad. Look, I'm balancing it with good works. It could be that. But it could also be this. I did my sacrifices, which would have been uh, the peace offering. And literally in the Hebrew, it's the peace offering. 
which would mean she had leftover meat. Some of the meat was given to the priests, some of it was a sacrifice on the altar, but then the rest of the meat she would have been able to keep for home. And so this could have very well been her saying, I got some steak ready or some lamb chops. She's appealing to his appetites and cravings. And not only that, but did you notice this picture that she paints for him? I've been out here. I've been looking for you. I've been seeking after you. I've got my couch ready, my bed ready, all these pictures of domestic life, all these sensual smells sprayed on it. And then what does she say to him? we got a whole night of delight ahead of us. She's filling him with these erotic fantasies that have no real human commitment behind it. It's a mirage. It's fake. It's all a trap to get him. And he doesn't know it. Then she ends with the words that seal the deal. Verse 19, my husband's gone away on business. He's not going to be back for a long time. Talking about the, the full moon and stuff like that. Probably he's two weeks away. The idea is, no one's going to find out. He's not home. He's not going to walk in at us. This is the great lie of the enemy. No one's going to know. Just a quick meetup. Just a quick lunch break at a hotel. Just in the bathroom alone. No one's going to find out. No one's going to know. And we chase this mirage of satisfaction that is only done in hiding, can never be fulfilled. Just like this fool follows the adulteress, he's okay to let his urges lead him and control him. People today would ask, what's wrong with that? We have these urges, why not just give in to them, right? These desires, these attractions, what's so wrong about giving in to them? And there are at least two reasons why you shouldn't. First, you are not a simple creature that is controlled by your urges. You're not a dog. You're you're not a simple creature. We are made in God's image. The only creatures on earth to be made in God's image. And these urges that have been given to us have been given in part by God so that we would experience a particular part of His glory when those urges are fulfilled. So food cravings, for instance. Food cravings are given to us so that we would look to God to give us this day our daily bread and then to eat to His glory. And the satisfaction that we get from a full stomach glorifies Him as the one who provides us all good things. It also is a foretaste of a greater feast coming when we will be feasting with God eternally. Same thing, sexual desires are given to us by God so that we would experience a particular part of His glory when those urges are fulfilled in the context of the one flesh union that He creates in the bond of marriage between one one man and one woman. God gave us these desires to be fulfilled in His holy context. At the same time, these desires have been corrupted by the fall. So that now, the urges and desires that we have as human beings are disproportionate. Not only that, but we are driven to... to, um, Instead of driven to glorify God by dependence on Him and obedience to Him, we make the fulfillment of the urges an end in and of themselves. So you look at our culture, which by the way is nothing new. The the things that we see on TV right now are the same things that were happening in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece and in every major civilization since the first one. Ours is nothing new, it's just televised. It's Instagrammed. But you look at our culture and it is given complete freedom to do whatever you want. That's what our society today tells you. You want to do it, you do it. You have desires, you have urges, you have the freedom to chase them, to fulfill them. And yet, we have the most depressed, unfulfilled, medicated people on the planet. We were told, 
What happens in the bedroom is none of your business. If a man wants to have an affair, if a woman wants to have multiple partners, if she wants a one night stand, if he wants to sleep with another man, what's it to you? It's not hurting you. That's what we were told. And the people were given the freedom to do and chase any and every impulse. Were they satisfied with that? No. Then we were told, well, all we want is, is equality, right? A homosexuality should be normalized. And then it happened. Not only is homosexuality accepted, it's celebrated. I mean, it's the most celebrated thing in America today. You can't even go to the grocery store here in one of the reddest counties in America and not be hit with pride products. They were given everything that they asked for. And so now we can ask, are they satisfied? Are they happy? Have they sat back and said, oh, after decades or centuries of fighting, we have finally gotten everything that we've been fighting for. Let's rest. Have they done that? No, because it still doesn't satisfy. So what do they do? Do they question their initial assumptions? Maybe we were wrong from the beginning. Do they do that? No. Do they search for something else to find fulfillment in? Like, man, this, this didn't really work out the way I thought. Is there something else out there that will fulfill me? No, they don't do that. Instead, they keep pushing the boundaries even further. Now, even to kids. And don't mistake me, it's not just homosexuality, it's every type of sexual sin. Sleeping around makes babies. What do we do? We just abort them. Sleeping around causes diseases. We'll just pump you full of meds. Going to an adult movie place is inconvenient. Well, we'll just put it on your phones. Every barrier of sexual immorality has been removed from our society. And yet, nothing is ever enough. Because there, and again, there is every type of sexual sin, nothing is ever enough because they're trying to find satisfaction in something that was meant to lead us to the only one who could truly satisfy us, which is Christ. But as I said, these original desires have been corrupted by the fall so that now we have urges that we were not meant to have. Every day, we have murderous desires. Every day, we have greedy desires, prideful desires, lazy desires. If we simply give in to every urge, regardless of what it is, this world will fall apart quickly. And... Aside from all of those things, it's sin. It's sin. Your world falling apart is nothing compared to eternity in hell. Sexual sin will cost you your life. And if that's true, we need to be aware of these traps that are laid by the enemy and avoid them. And then we need to do everything we can to follow this third point in the passage, which is this. Guard your heart. We must guard our hearts. And there are four things to guard your heart and to keep your soul safe. Uh, I'll help you remember them with the acronym KEEP, K-E-E-P. Four ways. First, K. The first way to guard your heart is to know God's Word. That's the K. Know. Know God's Word. Look back at verse 1. We're back at the beginning now. My son, keep my words. And treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. When I say that we must know God's Word, I mean we must know God's Word. I mean, listen to the verbs that are in this passage. Treasure. But what do you do when you treasure something? You dwell on it. You obsess over it. In seminary, I had a professor who used to say a little um, mild, obsessive compulsion over Scripture is always a good thing. And the language here is poetic. Keep it at, as the apple of your eye. It's, it's what you're transfixed by. Write, write God's Word on the tablet of your heart. And put it in you like a pacemaker. Like the only thing that's going to keep your heart beating the way that it should spiritually is by filling it with God's Word. Read it and meditate it and memorize it. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? 
by guarding it according to your word. If you want to be pure, and I have people tell me all the time, I just want to be pure, I want to be pure, I want to be pure. how much scripture are you reading? Well, I don't really have time for that. If you want to keep your way pure, guard it according to scripture. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Store God's word up in your heart as a preventive measure against sin. The Scriptures are life-giving. The Holy Spirit uses God's word to protect us, to give us healing, to give us restoration and protection. Why would we try to be pure without it? But what we tend to do is minimize or ignore Scripture completely and then fill ourselves with and treasure every kind of immorality. TV shows and media that expose us to immorality. And we protect that time. I don't have time for Scripture, but oh man, I can't wait till night at 7 o'clock my TV show's on. Oh, I have a whole, a whole series um, blocked off on Netflix. I can't wait to go and watch it, right? But I don't have time for Scripture. You're exposing yourself. We, we are lowering our defenses and inviting the enemy in instead of devoting ourselves and immersing ourselves and being engrossed with God's Word. The first way to guard your heart is to keep God's Word. The second way to guard yourself is to embrace wisdom. E, embrace wisdom. Look at verse 4. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. This is very interesting language that's um, foreign in our day. It says to call wisdom your sister, but it's more intimate than that. In Jewish language of the day, it was common to call your wife sister because it was your most intimate friend. Solomon does it in Song of Solomon, saying, my sister, my bride. It didn't mean they were actual siblings, but it pointed to this intimate companion. And so the picture Solomon is saying here is be intimate with wisdom, not the adulteress. Marry wisdom. So how do you do that? Well, it goes back to knowing God's Word. Live with God's Word. Don't shack up with someone. Shack up with God's Word. Embrace wisdom like Jacob when he wrestled the angel in Genesis 32, when he wrestled the Lord. What does he say? He says, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. Make that your attitude with wisdom. Cling to the Scriptures and say, I'm not getting out of this, God. I, I don't care that my five minutes are up or that my ten minutes are up. I don't care that I have to be somewhere. I'm reading this and I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to stop reading until you give me the wisdom that you want me to have to go out and fight these spiritual battles. If you come at this with, I've got to be biblically wise and I've got to do whatever it takes to make that happen because life and death are on the line, God will honor that. But it is a far cry from coming to Scripture and saying, well, i got a reading plan. i got to get this done. Let me, let me put in five minutes here so God's not angry with me throughout the rest of the day. No, 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 no. This is you are submerged underwater and this is the only air and oxygen you can get. Cling to it. Know God's Word. Embrace wisdom. Third way to guard your heart. Evade foolish situations. Evade. Verse 7, Solomon says, I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Passing along the street corner, uh, passing on the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. This fool is putting himself in harm's way. He knows where the temptation will be, and instead of avoiding it, he's stumbling to it. I mean, she may be like a prowling lion, but he's wandering around the lion's den. He's putting himself in a situation where he knows he will meet temptation. We live in a land where sexual immorality is everywhere. And so we have to walk cautiously. He knew where her house was and he didn't avoid it. We are to know where those temptations are and avoid them like the plague. Know what your triggers are and, uh, 
Be bold with avoiding them. If you find that you're always getting tempted at midnight, go to bed at 10 and tell your family, hey, hold me accountable to this. I want you to make sure that that I go to bed by 10 o'clock because when I stay up late, I do stupid stuff. Be honest with yourself and say, you know, whenever I do this, I'm always tempted. So don't do this anymore. And have people keep you accountable not doing this. Whenever I go here, I'm always tempted. Well, if that's true, don't go there. And have people accountable so that you won't go there. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all the saints who have gone on before us who are cheering us on, right? Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Colossians 3.5 is even more graphic. Put to death what is earthly inside of you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness with its idolatry. Put it to death. Now notice this. It says put to death what is inside of you. This doesn't say we go put to death the prostitute. Let's go execute all the prostitutes. Let's go execute all the people who commit adultery. Let's go execute all those who are doing pornography. It doesn't say that. Put to death what is inside of you. This isn't go bomb a strip club. It's bomb the immorality inside of you. And we'll talk about this more in a second, but for now, think of it this way. Any sinful desires you have, especially the sexual ones, you should be starving them, not feeding them. You should set up a blockade around your heart and around your mind so that the evil desires in you will not get the resources they need to keep living. If your phone causes you to sin, throw it away. Get a dumb phone. If you get tempted by driving a certain way home because it takes you by something that you know you're going to see and know you're going to experience and know you're going to go by, take a different route even if it takes you longer. If you're tempted by talking online to someone, stop talking to them. And I I know that there might be objections firing off in your mind, but, but I need my phone. How can I function without my phone? Society has lived for thousands and thousands of years without phones. Oh, but that's not our day. We can't do it. If you care about your soul, you will find a way to make it work. If your response, when I say cut these things out of your life, if your response makes you sound like a junkie excusing away their habit, it's time to stop cold turkey. So you stop talking to that old friend on Facebook. It's better to be thought rude because you're not talking to them than open yourself up to adultery. Put boundaries and accountability in place regarding screens regarding your time, even regarding your receipts. If you know that you can buy things a certain way that will hide it from your spouse, you go to them today and say, hey, I I have not been upstanding in the way I'm spending money. I want you to start asking for my receipts. You say, well, that, that might lead to weird questions. If you don't, it will cost you your soul. Don't be like the fool who keeps wandering into temptation. Evade foolish places where you know the adulteress, whether she's real or pixelated, is waiting. Evade them. And finally, I said we'd come back to this. How do you kill the sin inside of you? Yes, you starve it out. Yes, you set up a blockade around your heart. But how do you kill it? We kill it with the gospel. It's the final and most important way to guard your heart. P, put your trust in the gospel. Jesus Christ died to save sinners. And he rose again, demonstrating his power over sin and death, the same power that he gives to us at salvation. Let me be clear. You do not get to be with God in heaven forever because you weren't sexually immoral. You only get to be with God by faith in Christ. Because it's only in the gospel that we find forgiveness for our sins. It's only in the gospel that we're given the perfect, righteous purity of Christ. And it's only in the gospel that we're given the fuel uh, to fight the future sins, future temptations. Jesus' blood and, and sacrifice was enough to cover any and every sin you've ever committed. I mean, you may feel right now like, gosh, I'm... I I know my own past, I know my own heart, I know my own search history, and I'm feeling crushed by it. 
Listen, Christ's blood is enough. It doesn't matter how long it's been going on, how depraved your search history is. It doesn't matter how many people you've been with. There is mercy and forgiveness to be found in the Gospel of Christ. Romans 10 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there are no qualifiers on that. It doesn't say everyone will accept for people who've committed this sin. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if you've been trapped in immorality, or maybe you don't even see it as trapped, if you've been enjoying your immorality, but this morning God is showing you the eternal cost of those few minutes of pleasure, you can come to Christ today, right now. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You don't have to go home and and make sure everything is sanitized. No, you can come to Christ and say, look, all all I have is a sin. But you've told me if I bring my sin to you, you'll deal with it. And when you do that in faith, he takes that sin from you. He pays the penalty for it. And then he gives you his perfect, holy righteousness. And you will be made a new creature. He he doesn't just take you and say, yeah, you're a sinner. Let me uh, make you more presentable to the earth to the people. No. He makes you a new creature. He gives you a new heart. He puts His Holy Spirit inside of you. If you're already a Christian, you do have faith. You have been born again, but you still struggle with sexual sin. Yes, do all these things that I've already talked about, but use the gospel to execute the immortality, the the immorality inside of you. Christ is stronger than any habit, any action. That you have. You are not helpless in this fight because Christ is not helpless and He lives in you through the Holy Spirit. And so, as a believer, confess your sins again and cling to the righteous power of Jesus in the gospel, and that will execute the immorality inside of you. God has caused, called us to holiness and to purity. That's His will for your life, your sanctification, not to be sexually immoral. So don't don't be the fool who keeps wandering into it. How much does it cost? It costs you everything. But Jesus gave up his life so that we could have new life in him and have victory. So let's cling to him. Let's pray. Father God, we know you want us to be pure. Give us the desire to be pure. Father God, you've called us to be radical. You've told us that if our right hand causes us to sin, to get rid of it. If our eye causes us to sin, pluck it out. Father God, forgive us for not being willing to give up our time. Father God, I pray that you would overwhelm us with the reality of the weight of our sin so that we would run to Christ. Father God, if there are people here and they are caught in sin and they don't care, I pray that even now you would wake them up. Help them to put their faith in you. Help them know that they are more than their urges. They are made in your image. If there are believers here, Father God, who are caught in sin, I pray that you remind them that no temptation has come to them that can overtake them. You have always, you always provide a way of escape. And I pray that you would open up their eyes like a blinding exit sign to see the ways of escape whenever temptation comes. Help us be a people who loves to kill sin and to cling to the righteousness of Jesus. And we ask all this in your mighty name. Amen.